everyone and welcome to our first lecture. So in this lecture, we're going to cover section 1.1. And what you're going to notice is that in general for this particular course, I do have guided lecture notes printed out. At the top, I have this section of the text this refers to as well as a quick citation. Um, do know that a lot of this is copied directly from the text, but I've kind of just pulled out the most important pieces or the examples that I want to focus on. As you're going through here, you should still read through the chapter in the text. I do not always present every single example in lectures. Um, sometimes I'll add in additional examples that I want to cover um, that are related that I would like to go over too. Um, but these are kind of our lectures that we're going to follow. But you still want to make sure you're following on the text and reading there too. Um, what I try to do is kind of summarize important information in the lecture notes, bring in the important part of the examples that I want to go over, um, and then, of course, go through examples with you. I find it's a little bit easier in a more complex class to have something to guide us to fill in uh, rather than trying to write all these words down in a short amount of time. So hopefully you find these lecture notes helpful. Um, and again, if you've had me before, I do these in some classes, but not all. It sort of depends on the complex uh, complexity of the material, but where there is just so much background information on a lot of these topics um, and so many pictures, I thought this would be an easy way to jump into our course. So you'll see the same sort of format each week. So let's get started. Section 1.1 is really a review about just graphing skills in general and how to use graphing utilities, which basically means technology. So I'll show you a few of those options in class today. But of course, if you have other graphing <laughs> tools that you use, then that's fine as well. So graphing, of course, is a very important aspect in mathematics. The biggest thing is, is that it helps us to visualize what's happening with the data. And it's often the first step when trying to analyze real world data. And this really is true. A lot of times if we're collecting data, our beginning steps are things like organizing it in a table or a spreadsheet. Um, and then if we can graphing that data so that we can see what it looks like before we start jumping into formulas and things like that. So the visual part is really important, particularly when analyzing real world data. Now we're gonna be doing a lot of stuff in class by hand, but we're also gonna use technology too. Um, technology of course is very advanced now and allows us to graph easily. It allows us to model data better than trying to do everything by hand as well. Um, so you'll see a combination of these techniques throughout the course this semester. One of my favorite free graphing calculators is through Desmos. So I'm gonna show you this today as well. And it's desmos.com. That calculator I think is really easy to use and intuitive. It doesn't require a lot of like video help. Most students can just jump in and figure it out. So check it out, we'll see it today. I'm also gonna go through a little bit with the TI-8384 calculator with you, um, which is also excellent at graphing. I know I had one when I went back to, went back, back when I was in high school, um, which still actually works today. So they last a really long time, although they are expensive, of course. Um, if you don't have a TI-8384 calculator and you are in a STEM program, you may wanna consider getting one. So look out if they're ever on sale or you can get a good deal on one because you'll probably be using in other classes. Um, but for our class for right now, I also don't mind if you use an app on your phone um, and you're gonna see I'm gonna use that throughout the lectures. So there are similar apps that mimic the TI-8384 calculator. You know, there's slight variations, but they're very, very close that are really excellent. Um, I have an iOS phone, so the one that I use is called Graph and Calc 83. Um, sometimes it is free, depending on when you're looking for it. Other times it's a few dollars. I think I originally paid six dollars for it uh, many years ago, uh, but that's much cheaper than an actual TI-83 calculator, which can run up to hundred dollars. So that's a great option for iOS. If you have an Android, a lot of students like the Graphing Calculator X84 app, which again, also mimics it. Um, it's a little clunkier to use than the Graphing Calc 83 app, I won't lie. Uh, but again, it works very similar to the 8384 series and it is not expensive. <laughs> so it's a good option. Finally, Desmos also does have their own app too. So if you think you're gonna be using Desmos a lot, you may wanna just download the graphing app on your phone and then you have that easily accessible. The thing with Desmos is it's really for graphing, um, whereas the other calculators you can obviously do calculations on too. Um, but if you're looking just for something to graph quickly, then Desmos is a really nice option too. So before we get into technology, we do wanna learn how to graph by hand. So that's where we're going to start.
So let's review the very basics. And I think this part will probably be, I hope will be reviewed for most of you, um, but I just wanna go through some key terms and steps before we jump in. So first of all, what you see here is called either the Cartesian plane or the rectangular coordinate plane. Sometimes we just say coordinate plane. So all these words are interchangeable, but it's that two dimensional plane. So you have two real number lines that are intersecting each other. And on that plane, we obviously have some key features. And I'm just gonna go through them here, but I just underline quickly those keywords. And again, I think most of us are probably familiar with this. So your horizontal axis is typically labeled as your X axis, and your vertical axis is typically labeled as your Y axis. Now we're gonna use X and Y a lot in class, but as you get into real world examples, you may see different letters being used. For instance, we may use T for time, or we may use C for cost, and that is fine too. Your horizontal axis is typically your independent variable, um, whereas your Y axis is typically your dependent variable. So we tend to like to set our graphs up where the Y value is the one that is dependent on the X value, um, if you're using different letters instead. At the center where they intersect right here, we do have the point zero, zero, and this is called the origin. So it is that intersection there. Now, when we have points, we do always write our points in the form X comma Y. So the X value is listed first and that Y value is listed second. And the origin is that middle. You'll notice that those two intersecting lines make four areas along the graph. And these are called quadrants. So that's this next keyword. And we label them typically with Roman numerals and we work counterclockwise. So this is the first quadrant. This is the second quadrant, the third quadrant and the fourth quadrant. Now, really the whole point of that is just to be able to talk more easily. So sometimes I may say, everybody let's focus on the first quadrant. Um, so a lot of times we do focus on maybe just quadrant one, if all of our values are positive, it happens a lot for real world examples. Um, so the quadrants are nice just to be able to kind of draw your attention to a certain part of the graph. Now, as I already started mentioning, here we have an example of a point, which is also called an ordered pair. Uh, we say pair because there are two values, of course, and order because the ordering does matter. When we have our points or order pairs, we always list the X value first and the Y value second. So X, um, particularly if you're not using X and Y for your variables, is also called the first coordinate, the X coordinate or the abscissa, and the Y, again, it can be called the second coordinate, the Y coordinate or the ordinate. So those terms are all interchangeable as well. As you're going through your axes, you do wanna notice for your X axis, your positive values on your right and the negative values are on the left. And then for your Y axis, the positives are up and your negatives are down. Now I didn't fill in every single value here, but if you look, so here's five, one, two, three, four, five. You can kind of count out and see that those tick marks there or those grid marks are going by ones. So you do want to note your scale. Um, in this example, our scaling is just by ones, meaning all the tick marks are going by one value, but sometimes you may have a different scaling. Maybe you're going by fives or one hundredths or whatever it is. So make sure you're careful of your scaling as well. So let's just practice plotting some points. And again, I'll just go through this quickly because I'm pretty sure that everybody knows this, but we'll do it that review anyway. So here I have a few points that we're going to plot. They're each labeled with a letter, which is pretty common. So sometimes we will say point A or point B and just give a name rather than constantly always stating the pair over and over again. So I'm gonna start with point A here. And again, I'm gonna remember that my X value comes first and my Y value comes second. So each of these pairs represents just one point on the grid. So I find X is negative three first, which is gonna be over here. So here's my negative. So I go out from zero, one, two, three. And then my Y value is five. And my Y value is five is here. And what I'm gonna do is match those two values up to form my point. So I'm gonna see where those two values intersect and it matches up right here. So notice that if I line it up, I'm at five on the Y axis and I'm at negative three on that X axis. So there is point A. For B, I'm gonna do the same thing. So here my X value is two. So there's one, this would be two. 
And then my y value is negative four now. So negative one, two, three, four. And again, I'm gonna find out where those values intersect and draw my point there. So I can see that my point matches with two on the x-axis and negative four on the y-axis. For C, I see my x value is five, which is right here. And I do see my y value is zero. So if your y value is zero, you're staying on the axis. We're not moving up and we're not moving down. So my point goes right here and that is point C. All right, so for D, again, there's X and Y. So I'm at X is negative five, which is over here, and Y is negative three, one, two, negative three. And I'm just going to match up those two values and draw my point. I am labeling my points too. It does help to stay organized. All right, so here for E, my X value is zero. So I'm not gonna move right, I'm not gonna move left. I'm gonna say right at that center. And my Y value is positive four, which is one, two, three, four right here. So I'm gonna just go move right up and there is E. Now F we've actually pretty much already done, right? I already have zero, zero on here. So I'm just gonna label this as my point F, that's my origin. And then there is one more point over here. We don't want to forget that guy. Again, there's my X, there's my Y value. And here my X value is eight. So five, six, seven, eight. Um, this would be nine and then 10 would actually be over here. So just again, watch your scaling. And then I'm going up to two. So I'm matching up right here. So there is my G. Now you wanna notice that I do have some points on the axes and some points in the quadrants. So G for instance is in quadrant one, A is in quadrant two, D is in quadrant three, and B is a point in quadrant four. Point C is not in a quadrant, it would be on the X axis. Same thing with point E, E is not in a quadrant, it is on the Y axis. And of course the origin as well would be on both axes, but again, not in the quadrant. So in a quadrant would be actually in a quadrant, not on an axis. Now I didn't graph any fractions here in decimals, but you could do that too. And you just do that by estimating. So for instance, uh, let's see, let's call this H. If I wanted to graph maybe 2.5 comma uh, 0 0.3, I'm just going to do my best to estimate it on my graph. So my X value is halfway between two and three. So it'd be about right here. My Y value is only 0.3, so that's not quite halfway up. So I would maybe estimate that as right here and I can draw that in. So we can graph our fractions and our decimals as well, um, just by estimating them. When you're graphing with fractions, it may be helpful to change to a decimal just so you have an idea what that value is. So let's see, H, uh, I'm gonna label this J, I'm gonna skip over I, sometimes I is hard to read. And let's say I was trying to graph, um, you know, two thirds comma four. If you're not sure where two thirds is, you can take out your calculator and do two divided by three. And you'll see that it's 0.6666666. So it may just help to just have a estimate there. So you have an idea of where to graph it. So we're here, we're almost at one, but not quite. And we're going up to four. So kind of puts a bad value, but J would be right there. Now, I will note that when you're working in a program like my math lab, they may not let you graph certain fractions or decimals. So if you're finding that you're having trouble graphing in a technology program, particularly things like my math lab or homework helper tools, um, you may need to only graph integers. And if that's the case, um, as we get into graphing, you may have to just keep finding values that are integers as we learn to graph our equations. Um, and, you, and you'll see some examples of that coming up. So just kind of keep that in mind when we're doing it by hand, we can estimate pretty well. Um, some graphing utilities can handle decimals and fractions. Desmos is pretty good at it, for instance. Um, and the TI-8384 series is pretty good too, uh, but other programs may not be. Um, for instance, my math lab is not great with their decimals and fractions when we graph. So a lot of times they will only um, have you graph either very simple fractions like halves or quarters um, or whole numbers and integers. So just something to be aware of with technology.
So let's keep going now and actually graph um, some equations. So let's get into some examples there. So the relationship between two quantities can often be expressed as an equation in two variables. And remember, equations have equal signs. So we do have expressions too, which don't have equal signs, but equations, you do see that you have that equal sign. And we have two variables here. A solution of an equation in two variables is an ordered pair of real numbers such that when the values for the coordinates are substituted into the equation, we obtain a true statement. So that's kind of a long sentence, but basically a solution just means that when you plug in those values, you get a nice true statement out of your equation. And that definition is consistent throughout mathematics really for if you have an equation in one variable, two variables, three variables, and so on, it's that same idea of getting that true statement. When we have a solution, we will often say the point satisfies the equation. So if you hear that word satisfy, they're asking, is it a solution? So for instance, using that same example, we can see that the point three negative five is a solution, but zero one is not. So let's try that out. So that's my X value and that's my Y value, this is a comma. And what I would do is just plug it in. So here's my equation and I'm gonna go ahead and substitute in. I'm gonna substitute in negative five for Y and I'm gonna substitute in three for X. And I'm gonna, just gonna simplify using order of operations. Now just be careful here that minus sign is not part of the square, it's out front. So when I substitute in for three, only the three is being squared. And three squared is going to be nine, right? Because that's three times three. And then four minus nine is negative five. So you see that you get that nice true statement. So you do have a solution here. If I were to try zero one, and I'm just gonna rewrite that equation, keeping my work nice and neat. I'm gonna plug in one for Y, and I'm gonna plug in zero for X. And I'm gonna do my exponent first. Zero squared is obviously zero, and four minus zero is four. So this is not equal, this is false. So something like this is not a solution. Now, when working with variables, uh, excuse me, equations in two variables, which is different than in one variable, that we typically have infinitely many solutions. Um, so when you have equations in two variables, we actually can find as many order pairs as we want to by picking a number for one of the variables, plugging it in, and solving for the other number. So here's just one solution. But for instance, if I wanted, I could plug in x equals 1, solve that equation for y, and that would generate another solution. So equations in two variables are really nice because we tend to have infinitely many solutions here. Um, and that actually allows us to graph as well. So the graph of an equation in two variables is a set of all points whose coordinates actually satisfy the equation. So what does this mean? This means that solutions to the equation are the same thing as points on the graph and vice versa. So when you have that graph or that visual, you're actually seeing all the solutions of the equation. That's what the graph is. It's not just random numbers. It represents the solutions of that equation. So we can visually see that, which I think is pretty interesting. Now, there are lots of different ways to graph, and I'm sure you know some other techniques already. But for this beginning section, we're just going to review the point plotting method. Um, so your book calls it point plotting. I tend to call it plotting points method. It's the same thing, or sometimes you may have heard it as the table method, creating a table to find points as well. Um, so we're just going to focus on this kind of beginning method here. But as we go through the course, we will see other strategies on how to um, maybe more systematically graph different types of equations. Um, so there are other ways that you can graph linear equations or quadratics, circles, and so on um, using more systematic techniques. So how do you graph the plotting points? And we're going to do a couple of examples in just a minute. Um, but basically, all you do is you pick a value to plug in for either variable. Uh, for instance, just pick x equals 1, like I already mentioned. You're going to plug it into the equation, and you're going to solve for the remaining variable. So if you pick x equals 1, you would solve for y. And what's going to happen is this combination, this pair, would create one point. And you're going to plot this on your plane. Now, this is only one point. What happens is the more complicated the equation is, the more points you're going to need. 
So you may know from a previous class that for a linear equation, you really only need two points, but for curves, you need many points. So what you're going to do is you're going to repeat this process and find as many points as you need to plot to determine the shape of the graph. So sometimes that may be two points, that could be five points, that could be 10 points, that could be 20 points and so on. So you really just need to keep picking numbers and finding more points until you have enough where you're very confident about the shape of that graph. And that's the plotting points method. All right, so let's do two examples. So I'm gonna use that same equation that we've been coming back for. Now you can actually choose really any values you want as long as they're valid. Uh, we're gonna talk more about things like domain later, but for instance, um, things like we don't wanna divide by zero, right? Dividing by zero is undefined, we can't do that. So when you pick values to plug in, you just wanna make sure that you actually get an answer. Um, so just pick values that work. Here, where they're gonna be specific, they want us to use values between negative three and three um, that are integers. So we'll follow that strategy here. But normally at home, if it doesn't specify, you can pick anything you want. So I would pick numbers that are simple, that are easy to work with. Um, for instance, you know, I don't really wanna pick 100. Maybe if I'm using a graphing utility or if I need to do a big spreadsheet or presentation, sure. But if I'm just doing it by hand, I'm gonna pick some easy numbers. Now, they want us to use integers for X. So we're gonna plug in X values here. We're gonna start with negative three and end with three. I also like to make a table. Uh, I think it's easier to stay organized. So I'm gonna start with negative three and I'm also gonna plug in negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, all the way up to three. I'm gonna do this one at a time. Uh, maybe we won't do all of them together, but we'll start plugging these values and finding out the Y values. So I'm gonna rewrite my equation and I'm going to go ahead and start. So I'm gonna start with X equals negative three. And I'm just gonna take that equation and just plug in negative three and solve for Y. Again, you wanna be careful, this problem has a minus sign in it. And then the negative three is getting squared. So the four minus comes down and then negative three squared means negative three times negative three. That's gonna be positive nine. Four minus nine is negative five. And then I'm just gonna put that value in my table. And now I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna do it for negative two. So I'm gonna plug in negative two this time, going back to that original equation. Again, watch those minus signs. So this minus sign comes down here, negative two squared means negative two times negative two. So that's positive four. And four minus four is zero. I'm gonna plug in negative one. Now, negative one squared is negative one times negative one, which is positive one. And I get three there. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in zero. Now, zero squared is just zero. So this is four minus zero equals four um, and so on. So we're gonna plug in one, we're gonna plug in two, we're gonna plug in three. And if you guys want, pause the video, try that on your own. Um, and then we'll come back and you can check answers, okay? So when I plug in one, I'm going to get three. When I plug in two, I'm going to get zero. And when I plug in three, I'm going to get negative five. Now, in this case, you do see that repeating pattern because what's happening is that X value is getting squared. So it's basically not changing the value whether it's positive or negative here, uh, but that's not always the case. So you wanna make sure you do the work um, and work carefully. Now, each of these values in the table corresponds to your point. And I won't write them all out, but if you prefer, you could write these in point form. So each of these is just a point. I like a table when I'm graphing. I just think it's a little easier to stay organized, et cetera, uh, but they're all points. So I'm gonna go ahead and plot these and hope I have enough to see the pattern. So let's see, I'm, here's my X axis, here's my Y axis. So I have negative three and negative five. So my X value is negative three, one, two, three, and my Y value is negative five. So there's my first point. I have negative two, one, two, my Y value is zero. Negative one, one, two, three. I have zero and I'm up at four. So let's see, one, two, three, four. 
and I'm over at one and I'm up at three, one, two, three. I'm at two at zero. And then finally I'm at three and negative five. Now I did make sure I noted here that my scaling is by ones. So the grid that I have on this paper is going by ones for each of the tick marks and I'm able to graph. Now, once I have my, my points, I am gonna connect them um, either with a curve or a line. Typically, if you have any sort of squares or cubes, roots, um, division by variables is probably a curve. Um, so our lines are when we have just basic, just X and Y, no squares, no things like that. So typically you're connecting with a curve in most cases. And this is going to continue. I could find more points here. I could also plug in fractions or decimals or Y values. It really doesn't matter. But again, we wanna make our life easy. So we're gonna usually pick integers to plug in. And I can see the pattern here, this downward U shape um, that is a quadratic, if you've seen that before. And we'll learn more about quadratics later. All right, let's do one more example on graphing by hand here. So we're going to do the absolute value function. And we're going to split integers again between negative three and three, plugging in those X values. So do recall that this is the notation for an absolute value. It's two long lines that are straight. The absolute value of a number is always the distance to zero. Um, and unless X is equal to zero, the value will always be positive because distance is positive. So if you need more review, your book does have a review section um, in the front of it. It's all labeled as P. So there is more about absolute values back in that if you need that review as well. So let's go ahead and start plotting this. Again, I like a table. I think it's the most, the easiest way to stay organized. And I'm starting with negative three, going through all the integers, which is what the problem asked me to do, up to positive three. It is important to try to pick numbers, um, positive and negative, zero. Again, unless there's a restriction on it, um, so that you can see what's going on in, on all parts of the grid. So I'm gonna start with my function. I'm gonna plug these in. So my first one for X equals negative three, we're looking at the absolute value of negative three. Now absolute value is distance to zero. So if I were to graph this on a number line, just in one dimension here, I can see that I'm going one, two, three spots to zero. So my distance here is just three. When x equals negative two, I'm looking at the absolute value of negative two, which again is the distance to zero. And we'll see that I have to go two spots to get to zero. So my absolute value is just two. And hopefully you're noticing a pattern. Basically the absolute value of a number is really just the positive version of it because distance is positive. So the absolute value of negative one is just one. Now the absolute value of zero is zero. So you cannot make zero positive or negative, it's just zero. And now when you get to the positives, you're gonna see that the absolute value stays positive. So if you look at my grid here again, on my little graph, here's one. Well, I'm only one spot away from zero. It's still positive one. So our distance is never gonna be negative. We're not gonna switch the sign. We're always looking at the positive value. And same thing when X is two. So if I look at that little number line here, two is still two spots from zero. So the absolute value of positive two is still two. And the absolute value of three is three. I'm gonna go ahead and graph these. Here is my X axis and my Y axis. And starting here, my X value is negative three. So one, two, three, and my Y value is positive three, one, two, three. Again, I'm just going by ones here. If you want to fill in all the tick marks, you can. It just gets kind of uh, messy on the paper. So I don't want to make it too messy for you guys at home. Um, but you can fill those in if you find it easier. And then I have negative two, two. So negative two, two. Negative one, one. Zero, zero. Positive one, positive one. Positive two, positive two positive three, positive three. And again, you could find more points if you need it, but I feel pretty good about this pattern. This one actually is not a curve. It looks like it's pretty straight on the lines and it really is. So if you have a ruler at home, you may wanna go ahead and just take that out. These are gonna be straight lines when we have absolute values. And I'm just gonna go ahead and draw them on both sides. Now this does continue on forever because I could find infinitely many more points. 
again, in this particular example. And I can see the pattern. I know it's not going to go below zero here. That's a very clear pattern there. But I could keep picking more values, right? If I picked four, I would get four for an answer. If I picked 100, I would get 100 for an answer in, in this case. So these values are going to extend and your lines are going to extend. And you want to remember that all of these um, points on this curve, and there's all the points in between too. So in between even these first two points here, there are infinitely many points in between because I could choose the value x equals one half or x equals one tenth or x equals one hundredth. So all those values are still there. So there's infinitely many points here, which means that we have infinitely many solutions.